Good evening, everybody. My name is E.R. Anderson. I'm the executive director of Keras Circle. Keras Circle is a nonprofit programming arm of Keras Books. And Keras Books is the South's oldest independent feminist bookstore. I am here tonight with two folks who, if you're from Atlanta or New Orleans, you know well. Um, the one and only Big Frida is in the house. We're very, very excited. And Atlanta's own Taylor Alexander is here with us as well. So um, we are really excited to be having this conversation. We are bringing y'all together because Big Frida has a new book called Big Frida, God Save the Queen Diva. Um, so we're celebrating that. But Frida also has a new Christmas album coming out. All kinds of things are happening. Um, so we're going we're gonna to get right into it. I just want to tell y'all two quick things. One is that this event is co-sponsored by our friends at the Auburn Avenue Research Library. And our um, librarian friends are going to be in the chat dropping knowledge, dropping links, all kinds of things. So you can, you know, follow along. Those links will stay there. So you don't need to rush and click them. Just know they'll be there. You can go back after the event is over. So pay attention to what's happening on the stage and then go back and look at those links after the fact. You can ask questions at any time by clicking the ask question button at the bottom. And you see this big teal button. That's where you're going to click to buy Big Frida, God Save the Queen Diva from Karis Books and More. We'll send it right out to you tonight. Um, I'm going to go ahead and uh, let y'all really say more about your work. I, I think uh, we just have a little bit of time together, so we don't need to waste it on official bios. I think most folks know know your work. Um, so I'm just going to say thank you both for being here. It's a real, a real pleasure. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Hello. How are you? I'm good. How about yourself? I'm doing all right. You know, I'm just living and thriving as much as we can in 2020. Um, I see. Oh, over and done. <laughs> yeah, I'm ready for 2021. Ready for 2021. Yes, me too. <laughs> well, let's just jump into it because I know you got, you're a very busy person. I see you're decorating behind you. Yeah, I'm. I'm definitely doing Christmas decor, getting ready for Christmas. Is it your favorite holiday? What's your favorite holiday? Honestly, I think Christmas, um, you know, just brings a lot of family together. We get to exchange gifts and, you know, really have a good time. I bet, I bet. I've always wanted to go to New Orleans in, in Christmas. I usually go for Mardi Gras and for Southern Decadence. Uh-huh. Where have been during Christmas, so I need to go. One year. <laughs> but um, yeah, so I wanted to jump in. Usually I do like a, an introduction where I'm just like, listen, all of your achievements. But I feel like all 109 people in this chat know exactly who you are. But I want to ask you in your own words, maybe in some ways, you know, people don't know about you. Who is Big Frida? Well, I'm, I, um, you know, I'm a music artist and I reside and live in New Orleans, Louisiana. I do bounce music. Um, I'm responsible for, you know, taking bounce a little further outside of New Orleans and, and teaching people about the culture and the sound of bounce music around the world. I had a TV show on Fuse called Big Frida Bounces Back. Um, and, you know, I've just been out there doing music, making people have a great time and living their best life and um, being unapologetic about it and being myself and living in my truth. Period. Period. Well, I love to hear. I think, you know, for me, I know what bounce music is because the minute I get off the highway in New Orleans, it's all I hear. You know, I also DJ here in Atlanta, and whenever I put on some bounce music, the whole club goes up. And oh, yeah. like, as everywhere, it's, it's lit. That's it's just lit. Yeah. <laughs> you already know. But to the people who may not be in the know, what exactly is bounce music? Bounce music is up tempo, it's heavy bass, call and respond type music. It's a subgenre of hip hop. Um, it's based out of New Orleans. It has a lot to do with ass shaking and moving of the body parts. And it's a fun music that we love to play and represent here the culture of New Orleans. I love it. I love it. Because I think a lot of people have a a watered down idea of what bounce music is because I think everybody tries to bite the sound sometimes. Yeah. But when you hear bounce music and it's legit, authentic bounce music, you know exactly what it is. But yeah. I'm going to go ahead and jump into about this book, God Save the Queen Diva. 
Uh, for those who may not be in the know, I'm gonna read off a little bit about the book. God Save the Queen Diva is the memoir that chronicles the life of a poor choir boy from New Orleans who survived poverty, drugs, and bullying to become a world famous <laughs> musical performer and reality TV personality. Channeling his pain through the music and culture of Bounce, Big Frida is an icon for gender bending youth and is credited with bringing the twerk to mainstream. I think my first question is, what was the inspiration and the motivation behind writing a memoir? Like what drove you to put your life into words? Well, you know, a lot of times, um, you know, you don't think about writing until it's the right moment. And when I decided to write this book, I just felt like at that point in my life and in my career that it was time to tell some of the story. And when I decided to do it, I wanted to give the good, the bad, and all of the in-between. This book is not a, a book that's highlighting things that are false, but letting you see the struggles and the emotions of the things that I went through from a kid to currently now being an adult. And some of the struggles and adversities that I faced throughout my, my childhood with being black and gay and growing up in New Orleans and not being so accepted in the 80s and what we had to go through. And also my musical background, you know, my upbringing in church. It The book is about a lot and it takes you on this emotional roller coaster of things that I went through and hopefully that my story can help some young gay boy out there still trying to find his way or some mom who may not be as open-minded with her kid as my mom was or any of my friend's mom. And just the idea of seeing the musical journey and letting people know that where I come from and no matter how, you know, where you come from, if you follow your dreams and work hard enough, you can be successful and you can reach the stars. I love it, I love it. I think that, you know, so much of this book is very personal and deep and about a lot of pain. And I know that music is often a way that we as artists try to, to funnel our pain and our life experiences. What was the, were there any differences between you making music and you writing this memoir? Like, was it the same kind of process or did you feel like maybe you could be more vulnerable in the book or how was, how was the experience for you? Yeah, I think I definitely could be more vulnerable in the book because, you know, you only could get so much into the song, into each song, you know, and so much into the album. But with the book, you can have chapters and pages and you can go further into detail. So even having the TV show and doing music, the book goes a little deeper and able to really explain the stories and what went on and what happened at those times. The book gives you a little bit more room to be able to tell the story, you know? Right, right. I think, um, you know, I was reading part of it and part of the book um, focuses on, like you said, coming up in the music scene in New Orleans, the underground music scene, the nightlife scene. What about those scenes attracted you to them? Like what drew you to them? And honestly, considering how 2020 has gone, how, has, uh, how have those scenes kind of changed? Well, what drew me to it was just the love for the, the craft and the people you know, the culture of New Orleans and, the and, and you know, the fans, the promoters, you know, everybody in and around me is what drew me to it. And I think things have changed just because, especially now in 2020, we're doing everything mostly virtual. And it's not like actual being there and seeing the sweat sweat, <laughs> the people sweating on their foreheads. Mm -hmm. You feel the vibration in the room, the hollers and screams, the dancing. So things have totally changed um, when it comes to the performance side of things. Um, can't wait to get back to it. <laughs> <laughs> I bet, I bet. Do you have a do you have a favorite New Orleans like place to perform or favorite venue? Honestly, no, not really. I mean, but if I had to pick somewhere, I mean, I did Republic for a long time. I did you know Club Sam's for a long time, which I miss so dearly. You know, I did Rockefeller. There, there's so many places that I performed here in New Orleans. Um, you know, I think I miss the old clubs that, you know, were here before Katrina. And 
um, those were just the, the the beginning the beginning and the stumping ground days. So I really miss those moments that we had created. I wish those clubs were still around so I can show people, you know, where it got started. But most of those clubs are closed down, buildings are, are tore down. There's something totally new now. I think uh, it's always a good time when I go to New Orleans and I do like shows because I also do drag and music. And sometimes I perform it always. And mm -hmm. sometimes I perform at Hi Ho. All right across the street from each other. Yep. And whenever I come out of always, I'm like, oh, there goes Big Frida because there's a big mural of you right there. Yes, on the on the garage. <laughs> and I think uh, the first time I went to New Orleans, me and my friends were like, we have to find Big Frida. We have to meet Big Frida. And so we went to the CVS on the corner of Elysium Fields and Claiborne. And we were like, where's Big Frida? And they were like, we know where she at, but we're not telling y'all. <laughs> So it was a whole, it was a whole trip. <laughs> I, I bet. They, they probably didn't know how, where I was at. <laughs> just, you know, you know, that's just that New Orleans thing. Like, we we got her, but we ain't going to tell y'all. <laughs> They're so full of it. <laughs> it was a really good time. I think, um, you know, part of the book dives into, like, some darker parts of your life. And uh, some of that involves gun violence. You know, yeah. lost friends and you lost family to gun violence, and even you yourself, if I'm correct, suffered from a gunshot. Yes. Um, what do you? I think it's always. I try to draw parallels between New Orleans and Atlanta because New Orleans is a very black city, and Atlanta is a very black city. And whenever we have a gun violence in town, it's always the question of like, why is the black community doing this to each other? Mm. And I don't think anybody ever really has like the answers, but do you do you see causes of this violence in in the New Orleans black community? Like, do you see what might be driving people to to do this kind of violence? Yeah, most definitely. A lot of times it's hate, it's jealousy, it's envy. Um, it's some of the simplest things. It can be from, you know, a bicycle to a bag of weed to a carjacking. It, it could, it's some of the most ridiculous things that people are driving um, to to result in violence. And, you know, I just wish that our people would think about the, the resolutions that they can do versus, you know, using violence. Because a lot of times we they're doing stuff that they can't get themselves out of the trouble mm -hmm. or they wind up being in jail for the rest of their lives or they have to spend 10 years in jail, you know? So I would just want them to think about their actions before they even result to this violence. But there's a lot of things driving the crime here. And um, it can be the most smallest thing that turns into something big and outrageous. I feel that. I feel like it's very similar to Atlanta. It ranges from everything, you know? Yeah. We have like, you know, black neighborhoods who don't have a grocery store, who don't have a, a good school, and that causes people to look elsewhere and find yeah. what to do. And sometimes it's trouble. Um, yeah. So we're also working through it. You know, speaking on that, you know, being black, being gay, of the LGBTQ community, you know, the struggle is something that we know all too well and too personal. Um, what's something that gets you through the struggle? Like, what's was there like a piece of wisdom or something that was imparted upon you when you were younger that made you feel like everything was going to be okay? I mean, church did that for me, you know, um, praying was my outlet and, and church was my outlet that let me know that everything was going to be okay. Gospel music was my outlet when I fell down and depressed or, mm. you know, saddened against the world. I would just, you know, put on some gospel music and that will push me through. So, I, you know, people always ask me what my method is. It's praying and pushing. I keep praying and pushing. Have you put on a gospel album yet? Not yet. We're working on it. Is that the title, Praying and Pushing? Huh? That may be. <laughs> that's, that's always in the branding. I, that's, that's what I use. That great <laughs> idea. Praying and pushing. I'd buy it in a second. You know, because I think that, you know, for a lot of us, we've had such a a struggle with religion and being black and being gay and being yeah. queer. And I think sometimes, you know, sometimes when I need healing, I just 
go back to my hometown church. Yes. And then the boonies, the woods. Yes. Where they're still speaking tongues and and, yeah. and so don't, it get, don't it get you through though? It gets me through it. You know, sometimes I I think maybe I should go back to church and get into the faith. But I think I think we all have our struggles and we all have our our journeys and sometimes it's good to go back and get refreshed. Yeah, most definitely. That reminder, you know, it and I think that reminder helps keep me grounded as well, you know, of just where I come from and, you know, the journey of getting where I'm at too. True, true. And I think that, you know, as black queer people, we we find ways to bring that kind of energy and, and churchness to everything we do, whether it's with music, especially bounce music. Because I feel like when I see people dancing to bounce music, um, it's a whole kind of church of itself, you know, going to New Orleans and seeing like a second line, it's like church to me. Um, or even here in Atlanta, we got the ballroom scene and I feel like that's church for a lot of people. Um, I think uh, my next question is part of the book, you talk about kind of the mainstream success of it all. You know, uh, you have albums with rave reviews. You had a TV show. You're an icon, a legend. Uh, was there a moment where you realized that things were taken off, where you realized, oh, oh shit, it's about to pop off and things are happening? Um, I think that 2010 was kind of that year for me. Um, you know, when I hit the New York Times, things really started to blow up. I was in... Um, they came and did a big article piece on me. And then so many major outlets started to reach out. People started to know me that didn't know me, that was familiar with my music. Mm -hmm. And I was just like, wow, this is about to be the start of something new. And I kind of felt it then that it was going to be a new transition of life for me once that kind of started happening. Yeah, I think... Uh you know, for me, I've always known about your music through the community, but I feel like the the mainstream has just been every year, more and more people know who you are. And they're like, have you ever heard of Big Freedom? I'm like, of course I've heard of Big Freedom. Don't, don't come in. Right. Yes. <laughs> you should have said, oh, girl, you tried it. <laughs> <laughs> they really do, because we be knowing things, because we we just know. Like, we're on, we're on topic, but some people are just, you know, 10 years too late, but I'm glad they showed up to the party. Um, Cause you know, a lot of people, you know, may have discovered you through being on formation with Beyonce or being on nice for what with Drake or even yeah, like people that, that discovered me so many different ways. And every day that somebody's saying they just learned about me or they just ran across my TV show or they just heard my song with RuPaul or, you mm -hmm. know, or Kesha or something. So there's so many ways that people can learn about you. True. I think the way my mom heard about you was when it was probably 2012 and she came to Atlanta to see me because I'm from the country. And right where I was living, there was this big billboard that was advertising your TV show. Yes. And she was like, do you know who this is? Big, big Frida? I'm like, it's Big Frida. And yes, I know <laughs> who that is. And so she watched the show with me and, uh, that was kind of the beginning of our relationship of her understanding who I was as wow. being a, you know a queer person. I get that a lot. Yeah. <laughs> with, with guys, you know, what with, with gay guys who wind up watching the show with their mom and they get a, a better understanding of what it is and just my relationship with my mom, you know, and I'm glad I was able to share that with the world, um, you know, to helpfully help somebody else in their situation. Exactly. I think, you know, with all this fame, how it's just kind of been building up, you know, over time. Uh, how have you managed it? Have you have you struggled with it? Have you had any kind of like trials and tribulations with it? With what? With fame. Um, you know, it has its pros and cons. The 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 um, I think the struggle is for me the most. It's just when, um when I'm so, so busy and, you know, you want to always give all your fans attention. And, and sometimes I just can because I'm, I'm running from one place to the other. And you, you kind of feel guilty sometimes when you can't give everybody your time. But, um, you know, when you're an artist, you have your hands in so many different areas, especially when you're trying to make music and you're 
you're filming and you're doing all kind of other stuff. But um, for the most part, no, I'm, I'm, I'm grateful, you know, to have the fame. And um, the most important thing that I'm worried about is though is continue to chase the bag. <laughs> Yes, we have to secure the bag. Secure the yeah, bag. Yeah, honey. The fame don't go without the bag. Period. <laughs> well, I'm about to transition into some other questions, but I want to remind everybody who's watching, if you have any questions, uh, I'm going to get to them in probably two, three more questions. So make sure you drop the questions below because Big Free has got to decorate. I got to cook. So Boy down. <laughs> Um, but I want to talk about like the future, and, you know, the plans, the goals, the dreams. Uh, so obviously, like 2020 has been trash. <laughs> a shit show. It really has. And, you, know, you know, for 2021 and, and for the future, I just continue to plan on to grow and to continue to make great music to put out into the world, mm -hmm. continue to bring good energy and good love and light to the world continue to prosper in my business and my branding and, you know, want to do some more TV stuff, you know, working on my restaurant, continue to work on great music and, and more albums. I have a Christmas album dropping on December the 11th and it's going to be smoking Santa. It's going to be hot. So I'm excited about that because it's a new project. I'm going in a new direction of the way that I deliver and, and put out, my music, the, the the tracks are even harder, so it's just you know I'm 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 trying to step it up each each time and continue to grow. The the biggest thing is growth, and 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 making sure that I secure my future and secure myself and my family for when I get ready to retire. Ooh. Retire. Well, you know, one day it's gonna happen. <laughs> I'm not gonna be a twerking, a twerking granny all my life. <laughs> <laughs> That's real. That's real. You know, after you do all the work, you gotta enjoy the benefits of what you created. Oh yeah. Do you have more from when you retire? Are you just gonna focus on restaurant industry or? I mean, I, no telling where my hands are to be when I retire. <laughs> you know, but I do plan on having multiple things going, and um. I don't feel like I will retire completely, mm -hmm. maybe just from one thing and still have my hands in five to 10 more things at the same time. True. Well, I'm excited for Smoking Santa Christmas. It's uh, it's produced by a boyfriend, right? Well, she's one of the, the uh, producers on it. Mm -hmm. Awesome, I'm super excited. Um, let's open it up for some questions. Yeah. Let's do it, let's see. I got one up here. Oh, let's see. I'm about to say, we're never going to let you retire. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Trisha Harding also uh, sent in this question. What happened to the show on Fuse, and is it coming back? It's over, and it's not coming back. Ooh. You know, I mean, we, we went to six seasons. Mm. You know, we were up for renewal for the seventh season, and they were not. Uh, up for renewal. The fans are steady demanding it. It's still the number one show on Fuse. Mm. So you tell me what's the problem. <laughs> <laughs> if they asked you to come back for a new show, would you? If the bag was correct? Oh, the bag gotta be correct. Oh, I ain't coming back. <laughs> Here you go, <laughs> I'll call Fuse, though. <laughs> yeah, y'all email Fuse. Y'all talk to Fuse. Let's see. Okay, we have a question from Brianna. It says, I think both of you briefly mentioned your parents beginning to learn and accept you. What did that process look like? And what advice do you have for a young black queer person who is still closeted to their family? Well, for me, um, my mom kind of already knew. And when you're, you are a parent, I think that if you're paying attention to your kid, you kind of should already know um the feelings of your kid what your kid is into if you pay attention to your child so by the time i did decide to tell her at 12 and i told her at my birthday party she was like boy i already know 
<laughs> but the most important thing was when she gave me her approval and accepted me, that's what gave me confidence to be who I wanted to be and to live my life. And she was my biggest cheerleader. She was my biggest supporter. And the, the most important advice that I can give is to continue for that child to be their self, live in their truth. It may not be as easy. Um, I think the path of the struggles that you will have to face and go through will make you a stronger individual and you will understand your story once you get a little bit older. I recognize that. I think that, you know, as much as we want our family to understand us at the very beginning, sometimes it it takes time. You it know? does. It was, it's not uh, so easy to just to put it in somebody's face and expect them to swallow it right away. You know what I'm saying? Things take time to grow. Things take time to develop. And over time, um, I think that, you know, things will start to ease a little bit lighter and lighter each year. You know, that's just like growing up in my neighborhood. They started to accept us a little bit more each year because they saw we wasn't going nowhere and we was there to stay just as well as them. So all the gay boys in the neighborhood, each year they started becoming more and more friends of ours. And kind of the same thing with your family. It takes time and it takes patience. And um, it takes you also being true to yourself and loving yourself before you can go out and ex ask anybody to love you. Period. Yes. That is the gospel truth. Let's do a, let's do a, a fun question. Let's do it. So Joy is asking, what is your absolute favorite thing to cook? Absolute favorite thing to cook. That is so hard because I like to cook so much. <laughs> mm. Um, honestly, I love to cook my mom's cornbread dressing, excuse me, mm. but yes, cornbread dressing be off the chain, but just like a quick everyday meal that I can slay in 30 minutes and everybody is in here licking their fingers is some pork and beans with smoked sausage and wieners. <laughs> they a good old, good old pork and beans. <laughs> I have another question on top of that. It was just Thanksgiving, and I want you to settle the debate. Some people were saying that you are supposed to put fruit in your dressing. Bullshit. <laughs> That's all I needed to hear, because I was fighting with some people. They were like, put some apples, put some... I'm like, no. They rung Kamala dressing up on the shade run for them apples. You hear me? <laughs> we don't do apples in our dressing. We don't do no type of fruit in our dressing. Mm -hmm. You want your stuff to have a sweet and savory. The sweet is the cornbread. The savory is your, your ground meat and your shrimps and your gizzards or your crab meat. You you have your, your balance of sweet and savory. Why go through some apples or some pears in some dressing? Girl, please. <laughs> That's all I needed to hear. That settles it. I'm not fighting with nobody else. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Let's see. Um, we have a question from, I think this is an easy question. Will you be doing any more concerts? I'm assuming that's, have you done virtual concerts? Tons. Yeah, tons of virtual. That's all that's happening right now. And it's, it's nothing like virtual. True. Ooh. Oh my God. Trying to figure out these last few questions. Oh, it's fine. She's on everything okay? They everybody all right? No, everything okay over there? Yeah, somebody we know something happened, got shot at or something. More drama. Oh, I hope they're okay. Me too. Uh, let's see. Joy has a question. What has been the role of culture in your life, especially in terms of servicing? Oh, let me rephrase this. What has been the role of culture in your life as a resistance to racism and homophobia? Well, I speak for the culture. And, um, for me, you know, I, I don't accept any of that. You know, I, people love me. I put out great energy. 
I represent the culture and speak for those who don't have a voice to speak for. And I, I know when to tell people where to get off at. And, you know, I usually don't have that problem, though. I have been, you know, I haven't really had any homophobia in such a long time. Mm. Um, I'm grateful. I went through it enough as a kid. And, you know, if it comes to me right now, I don't think they would like the response. Because I'm so confident in who I am now even more. And I know my meaning in life. So I don't think it, it's the right time to come at me with no drama. Exactly. Because when you know yourself and you're confident in yourself, nobody can take anything from you. Let's see. We're going to wrap things up. If you have any last questions, please drop them below. Okay. Um, we have one from Morgan. Hey, Morgan. I know Morgan. Uh Morgan asked, as a professional artist, what advice do you have to other creative folks who are struggling to stay dedicated in their craft and motivated, especially in Raggedy 2020? So, I mean, that's just it. You have to believe in your craft and you have to be determined. You have to have a drive um, like nobody else. You have to, to work hard because hard work pays off. You have to be very consistent. You have to keep thinking of new ways and ideas to be creative. And, you know, that's what makes it fun because you have a chance to be so creative. The sky is the limit. You know, you can network. You can do great collaborations. You know, you push your best foot forward and continue to grind. The grind is real. I the recognize it. real. It is true because I had a whole album this year and I had a whole tour that I had planned out and then Corona came through, snatched all my kids. Yes, me too. I was going on tour with Kesha and all that got washed away. Ooh. Well, hopefully it happens again once we get you, the vaccine. Yeah, it, it will. But you think of, you know, you think of new ways to brand yourself and you think of new ideas. You think of new ways to put out music. You know, you challenge yourself to say, what can you create for this world that's different? What can you do to make you different from everybody else? What can you do to leave for your legacy? So there's so many things you can push yourself towards to um, continue to make uh, great music and be creative as an you know a upcoming artist. I agree, I agree. Well, I think if nobody else has any more questions, I think that's the end of our discussion. Thank you so much for chatting with me. Anytime, anytime. This has been the highlight of my year. Yeah, funny. <laughs> I love it. Ooh. Ooh. Uh, I just want to thank you both. This was amazing. I want to encourage everybody who's watching at home to go ahead and click this teal button right here. Bye, Big Frida. God thank save you the so much. I appreciate it. Yes, please buy that and get the Christmas album, which comes out on December 11th. Is that right? That's December right. Line? Okay, so go ahead and get that. Get that from your local uh, music store or online. Um, we just appreciate y'all, Taylor. Thank you so much. Support Southern Fried Queer Pride. Um, and uh, also support the Auburn Avenue Research Library, which um, has given us all these great resources tonight. Just so y'all know, they will stay up. You can click them at any time. This will immediately be available for rewatch. Um, so, you know, come back uh, and share it with your friends. But I hope everybody has a great, safe night. Stay stay well, stay healthy, and have a very happy holiday season. Happy holiday. Thanks so much, Taylor. I appreciate it. Much love. Thank, Thank you. you. You're welcome. Bye-bye.